Welcome back, everyone. Um, congratulations for getting through or at least putting behind you and not turning in the last homework because that one was rough. So I made it up to you on this current homework, which unless you are totally programming a verse, this is going to be much, much easier and much, much faster. There are two problems for you to actually do and then I don't remember. Um, there's one programming problem and one proof, which is the proof I'm about to do right now, adapted to a discrete situation. And I'll show you as we go how that might work. Um, but this is, I've already heard from two people who have already finished this homework. <laughs> um, and what else? Let me start sharing my screen while I think here. Okay, so problem one on the current homework is really a problem that could have been on the last homework. It's just another one of these uh, superposition and thinning problems. And so I would define for this problem three processes, N1, N2, and N3, that will be the number of checking account transactions by time t and the number of savings account transactions by time t and the number of mortgage transactions by time t. So in B, we have in the first 30 minutes that the bank is open, um, there's first 30 minutes the bank is open, there is, are exactly 20 customers that have come into the bank. So we've got like the overall process as well, which was given as a Poisson process. So when you thin them out, um, we have that this N of T is a Poisson process with rate 30, and then the N1 of T is a Poisson process with rate 60% of 30, which is 18. So I'm gonna call that lambda one. And so we have all these individual Poisson processes. So I have a lambda one, which is 18, a lambda two, which I think is nine, and a lambda three, which is three. I think I did that. Um, so for part B, first 30 minutes, the bank is open. So, so far all the rates have been given in hours. So let's work in hours. So let's use one half instead of 30 minutes. And so what I want for B in the first 30 minutes, exactly 20 customers have come into the bank. Find the probability that none of these customers are there for a mortgage transaction. So we just want the probability that, so this is my mortgage transaction process. We want the probability that the mortgage transaction people at time one half is zero given that the total process at time one half is zero. So there's two ways to answer this. One is to do the binomial kind of thing where you talk about a mortgage transaction being a success and then a non-mortgage transaction. So combine the others being a failure. Or you can just start writing this out. So if you write it out as a probability over a probability, then you would want to rewrite the numerator so that you can split things up. So if n3 of 1 half is 0, I, this 20 up here, this 0 up here should be a 20. Okay. Then um, you can rewrite this condition to get rid of the n3 so that you have something independent by saying that n1 of 1 half plus n2 of 1 half needs to be 20. And now this is independent of this because all the three processes are independent of each other. And yeah, and then you just go. So um, the hint I wanted to give for problem two, I left this one blank so I can talk about problem two, but now I talked about another one, is for problem two, there's not much to say because once I give you this hint, it's going to be very fast. And that is, I would use the binomial theorem. So recall, this means that A plus B for some real numbers to the N can be written as the sum as K goes from zero to N of N choose K, A to the K, B to the N minus K. And so, 
here you've got some A's and B's raised. You've got an ith power. And I know that I looks weird, but it's going to come up um, on Monday that we need these actual, we need these three expressions. Um, so yeah, you've got like one minus lambda h to the i. I personally, you don't have to do this, would turn this around only because I don't want to deal with this messier exponent. And so if that is my b, then that will completely disappear. But then you have a bunch of terms and you just want to figure out what terms you have that are not little o of h and then the rest of them. So all the terms that contain an h squared or higher wrap up into one little o of h term. And the rest of the stuff is your answer. I would do the same thing for problem B. I would expand that with the binomial theorem. And then problem C is actually a combination of the results of A and B. So I wouldn't do any expansions there. I would cite A and B. OK, let's uh, finish up our proof of the accept reject algorithm. So as promised, I wrote it up ahead of time to not drag you through this again. OK, so we were proving the accept reject algorithm in the continuous case. And for problem three on the homework, you want to write a proof in the discrete case. And um, so you just want to ad adjust this a little bit. And it's going to be super easy once you have this proof, which, by the way, is written up in the simulation notes, which are, are separate from the module notes. So the accept reject algorithm says we have some kind of target PDF. This is a distribution that we want to sample from. Uh, so I call it the target. And this algorithm works for both discrete or continuous random variables. And I am doing the continuous proof. And in problem three, you're supposed to adjust it to be a discrete proof. So before you can run the accept reject algorithm, if you have a target PDF f, you want to find a function g that is always above f. And I was a little less detailed writing this down because I didn't want it to be as messy. But really, it only needs to be above f on the region of interest, so the support or the domain for f. But really, I, I don't like to say domain because PDFs are usually defined everywhere, but they're zero in a lot of places. So I like to talk about the support, which is where they're not zero. Um, but if you say domain, that's OK. So we have another function that bounds our function on the full domain. And we need to be able to normalize G to a PDF. So because the PDFs are non-negative, G is already non-negative. So that's one hurdle on the way to becoming a PDF. But the other one is we need it to integrate to 1. So if you integrate the G, and this is over the whole region, so maybe minus infinity to infinity or maybe 0 to 1, whatever you're working with. Um, if you can, if that's integrable and you get a finite constant, then you can put one over that constant in front of G. And now you have something that is non-negative and integrates to one. So this H is a valid PDF. So that's the free algorithm stuff. You got to be able to find a G for which you can do both of these things. And then the algorithm is like this. You simulate a random variable Y from the PDF H. And for us, that means we're going to have to do because we only have one method, really, and that is the inverse CDF method. Um, now, in real life, you're probably going to be doing this one using built-in functions. Because on this homework, I have you doing accept or reject on the gamma distribution using the exponential distribution as your h. And I did say to do all of that from scratch, which means use the inverse CDF method to draw the exponentials. But most software can just pop out exponentials for you. There's usually a command for that. And in real life, you wouldn't have to do that step yourself. But you simulate a random variable y from the distribution h. You draw or simulate or produce or grab a uniform 0, 1 that I'm calling u. And if u is less than or equal to f of y over g of y, you accept y as a draw from f. That is your output. And you are done getting one single draw. And you repeat this for as many as you want. And if this did not happen, you throw everything out and start over. And so all of these y's and u's are independent of each other. Each Within each run through this algorithm, y and u are supposed to be independent. And then dropping everything and starting over is just starting over totally independent things. So 
to prove that this works, um, I was letting X be the output of this algorithm, the first accepted Y. And what we're trying to do is get draws from a PDF F. So I want to show that the PDF of the output of the algorithm is actually F. So in your homework on problem three, I would start with the probability that X equals X and go and do something similar to what we're about to do. But because I'm doing a continuous case, this probability is always zero. So I'm gonna start with the probability that X is less than or equal to X, whereas you can use equals. You can also do this, but I don't know, I think it'll be easier to use um, X equals X. So what do we want in the end? This is not a, this is not the PDF. This is actually the CDF, which is gonna be the integral from minus infinity to X of the target PDF. Or if you went and defined that ahead of time, then your goal is to get F of X. So stop me if you want to, but we've already talked about most of this. So I'm going kind of fast. Um, so here's where we were. We decided to not exactly condition on, but expand the probability and then sum back to a marginal probability. The total number of trials until the first success. So this is gonna be the probability that X is less than or equal to X. And um, the first success, by success, I mean accept. So the first accept is on the nth trial. And by saying first, well, there should only be one because once you accept, you start all over if you want another draw. So you're really not gonna have multiple accepts anyway. But I did write uh, one. I did write first accept to really drive that home that these are disjoint events. And yes, I could have written the probability that X is less than or equal to X given that thing times the probability of that thing. But it's just not helpful for what I'm gonna do. So I left it in this um, intersection form. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, this means that we had n minus one failures, and then the nth y we drew is less than or equal to x, and the nth uniform we drew was enough or was in the right place to make us accept that value. So I'm gonna write this as the probability of n minus one failures. A first approach that people take when they try to solve this is they try to condition on all the things that happened before on y1, y2, u1, u2. We're gonna see that it's really not important. Um, that would be a huge you know, n-dimensional integral, but we can, we can get away without doing that. So I've got n minus one failures. I've got the nth y less than or equal to x because that's the one we're gonna accept. So that's gonna be our value of capital X. And then the acceptance. So I have the nth uniform, which I haven't defined either of these, but what is meant by these is I'm going through a sequence of random variables until I get an acceptance. So I want that uniform to be less than or equal to F of YN over G of YN. So again, you could use CDFs for the discrete case, but I probably would use PDFs. So I, I would start with that and I would have that and I would have that. And you're just gonna have to adjust. I won't, I won't say any more because it's almost done because you're just adjusting this proof. Okay, so these failures consist of draws of Y1 through YN minus one and u1 through un minus one. And those are independent of these random variables. So actually um, this yn is independent of this un as well, although there is a yn over here. So I don't just wanna factor these two apart because there's a yn on both of these. But by independence, I am gonna factor out the first part. 
So this is the sum of the probability of n minus one failures, which looks like it's going to be a lot of work, but it's not, times the probability that yn is less than or equal to x and un is less than or equal to this f of yn over g of yn, which makes sense for a uniform because g is always above y, so this ratio is always less than one. So let me just get rid of this so I don't run into it. OK, so to continue, I'm just going to simplify this alone and not drag the whole sum through. So let's look at the probability that yn is less than or equal to x and un is less than or equal to f of yn over g of yn. And you might see this algorithm written differently because g is defined to be c times h. So if you're looking up a proof somewhere, well, first of all, they might use completely different letters for the functions, but this g could actually be replaced with um, c times h because that's what it's equal to. So to get this probability, my y's are continuous and they are being drawn from the distribution with PDF h. So I'm going to condition on y. So I'm going to go in general from minus infinity to infinity. I'm just going to copy this down and I'm going to let yn be fixed to be y and then use the PDF h un less than or equal to yn over blah, blah. Given yn is some y times h of y dy. So um, if I plug this yn in here and here, two things happen. One is that I get, oh, let me write it down. So for the first part, I get little y less than or equal to little x. And those are both constants and really not interesting for the probability. So we'll deal with that in a minute. But I get un is less than or equal to f of y over g of y. And then what's in the probability only involves, the, the only random thing in this probability is the u. And because this is independent of this, I get to drop the conditional part. So I will. So um, this is since yn is independent of un. OK, so let's say I drop that. I don't want to write a whole new line just to drop that. I want to deal with this y less than or equal to x. And y is the variable we're integrating over. And this entire probability is going to be 0 if y becomes greater than x. So it's kind of like I have the statement, the probability 1 is less than or equal to 3, and something else is happening. Like This is irrelevant as long as 1 truly is less than or equal to 3. So I can remove this as long as I put that into the limits of integration. And we get um, the integral as, as y goes from minus infinity up to x. And then the rest of the stuff, un less than or equal to f of little y over g of little y. And then h of little y dy. OK, we know this probability because u is a uniform 0, 1. And just on the side here, uh, if you have a u that is uniform 0, 1, then you have a PDF that's a flat line with height 1 from 0 to 1. And if you're looking at any x between 0 and 1, the probability that your uniform is less than or equal to x is this area, which is x. So applying that to the the probability at the, um, at the top of the screen now, this is my x. And that probability is just going to equal that. So I get the integral from minus infinity to x of f of y over g of y, h of y, dy. And g and h were pretty closely related. Forgive the scroll, but uh, h is 1 over c times g, or g is c times h. Um, 
So I can write this one as one over C times G. And then I can cancel the G of X uh, of Y. I'm sorry, this should be a Y. Then I can cancel the G's. And we are left with one over C times the integral minus infinity to X of F of Y dy. And if you would like, we're not finished with the problem because this is just a piece of the sum. So I have to put it back in there. But if I were you, I probably would have defined a CDF for F in the beginning. Like I would have said, let F, capital F, be the integral minus infinity to X of this thing. And if I did, then this is just that CDF evaluated at X. So one over C, capital F of X, the target CDF. So I'm gonna try to pull this all together now. What we had above, so far we have that the probability that X is less than or equal to X is the sum over all n from one to infinity of the probability of n minus one failures times um, this other stuff that we just worked out. So that is the one over C f of x. And to finish this, I need to figure out this probability, but check this out. So if you're doing um, probability mass functions and not CDFs, then at this point, you're going to um, sum both sides over all x. But here, I'm going to take the limit of both sides with respect to x. So there's no x in here. But this is a CDF. And CDFs always go to 1 as the argument goes to infinity, because that is saying the probability that uh, a random variable is less than or equal to infinity, which is one. So CDFs go to one in the limit. And if you're using PDFs at this point, you might sum both sides and say that the sum of the PDFs is one. So I'm using the fact that the limit of a CDF is one. So the limit as X goes to infinity of any CDF is one. So I've got a CDF over here and a CDF over here. So I've got one equals this sum, one over C times one. And I, I don't know, you can pull this in the front if it's bothering you. But from this, this is awesome. We see that C is the sum. So I don't need to compute it at all because I'm going to go back up to the um, top line there that, you, that is starting to be cut off. And if I plug C in for this guy, it's going to cancel with this 1 over C. And here's what we wanted. We are done. We are there. So let me copy and paste that just in case you don't see what I'm doing. OK, so what we just showed is that this is C, and we'll get cancellation. And we've got the CDF for the output is equal to the target CDF. And if you don't like working with CDFs because there was none in the problem, you can now take the derivative of both sides with respect to x, and you'll get that the PDF for the output of the algorithm is equal to the target PDF, which is what we wanted to show. So again, yours is going to be really similar. Um, if you condition on y, actually, actually, I would I would definitely recommend um, on the homework not doing the CDF and using the PDF because. It, you will be able to avoid the problem of looking at the yn's being less than or equal to x. And acceptance will just mean that yn equals x and un is in the right region. I don't know. Do what you want. But I think the PDF or probability mass function, if you are 
literal about your acronyms um, is, a, is a much easier approach in the discrete case. Yeah, it is the same thing with sums instead of integrals. Um, but I also think it's easier on the homework to, to start with this and then to get this rather than using CDFs, but you could use CDFs. This is all written up in the simulation notes. So you, you really just have to look at the lines and trace through them and adjust it. So this problem shouldn't take very much time either. So problem four on the homework, um, you're actually gonna try this out. And um, in 4B, you're using the accept reject algorithm. And I did wanna say, something about this. So homework seven, 4B. So you want to simulate a random variable X. So now I'm using X as something different. It's not the output of the algorithm, but the target random variable. And it's the gamma three, two distribution. And you wanna simulate it using accept or reject with, um, an exponential, oh, no. Okay, it doesn't say with what, <laughs> but I would suggest using an exponential because it's easy to draw from and will work for this problem. So yeah, let me back up a little bit. Um, the way the algorithm is stated, you wanna start by finding a G that's always above the target. Now our target F, is one over gamma of three, two to the three, um, x to the three minus one, which is two, e to the minus two x for x greater than zero. And so you want to find a function that bounds that above that you can then integrate and get something finite. So you can normalize that into a PDF that you know how to draw from the chances of you actually ending up with a PDF that you know how to draw from at this point are small. We don't have many methods. So I would go for the exponential, which means I would not write down G, I would start with the H. So I'm gonna um, take the, T, the PDF I want to draw from to be an exponential. And you could fix your Lambda, I absolutely would, although some Lambdas are gonna give you problems. And so what, what we have right now is the target. This is the F. And the other exponential PDF, so this is the H. And you can work backwards to actually find a constant that you can multiply H by to make this high enough that it's above F. So you want a constant C such that, hmm. the way I'm gonna write this is not the same way I used C in the algorithm. But I'm not sure I wanna use C the same way because it's so artificial and shows that we're not really understanding what's happening. We want a constant C such that G of X is C times H of X. Now in my algorithm, g of x, oh, that was right. That's the same c. That is the same c. It's h of x was one over c. Okay, so um, you want this to be greater than or equal to f of x. So if you look at c times your h, which I'm proposing that you use an exponential and you want that greater than or equal to your gamma PDF, and let's just simplify this. Gamma of three is two factorial, which is two. And two to the three is eight. So we have a four. So we want this greater than or equal to four X to the two, E to the minus two X, which means you want C greater than or equal to four X squared E to the minus two X over lambda e to the minus lambda x. This is how a except or reject usually ends up going. You specify the thing you can draw from first and back it up and find the bounding g. 
And so here's where you can see like where your choice of lambda is important. If you choose lambda to be equal, oops, equal to two, then the exponential is going to completely disappear. And as a function of x, this is just going to keep increasing. And you can't get an upper bound. So you'll have to think about should you choose a larger lambda or a smaller lambda? But basically, choose a lambda, simplify this, and maximize it with the derivative. And then um, you would plug that maximum in to, oh, no, then, yeah, you would plug that maximum in to define your function g. So you would take your exponential PDF and multiply it by the c you found which is not the maximum, it's the location of the maximum. So again, I would take C to be the maximum over all X greater than or equal to zero of that thing. So we reverse engineered it so we can draw exponentials. We've got everything we need to run the algorithm. You can draw exponentials using the inverse CDF method and you can draw uniforms for the acceptance step. And so it's a three-step algorithm that you just want to put a loop around and simulate a bunch of values for. We're, I don't want to do it now because I want to do some other things. We've been in simulation break way too long. But the probability of acceptance on any one trial is, well, we can show that it's 1 over C. And so the probability of acceptance, this is actually for any one trial. So you want that to be large, which means you want C to be small. So you definitely don't want to overkill this inequality. And furthermore, you would like this to be as close to this as possible. This is in real life. Here I'm saying just use an exponential. Um, but the, the goal is to have your number one, your, um, your H, the thing you can simulate from, be as close to the target density as possible and to be, quote unquote, heavier in the tails. So if this is your target, you want your um, you want any sort of pr proposal density to be, this is an awful drawing because these don't integrate to one, but to be even heavier in the tails or you won't be able to maximize that ratio. And if you want to do it, fine, but I am not looking for any kind of optimization for this homework. I would suggest just using an exponential and doing it. And you get to pick your own lambda. So you can fix that right away as long as the ratio can be maximized. All right, simulation break is over. Um, but that was still a lot of fun, even if you're not interested in simulation, because it was some cool conditional probability to to show that that holds. And this is a lot of what I do in my research. You know, I'm an algorithms person, but it's more like developing this, the recipe, the series of steps, and then proving that it's going to give you the right thing. And maybe perfectly. So um, we are going to get away, kind of, from Poisson processes finally. We're not really going to get away as much as we're going to generalize them into other types of continuous time Markov chains. So remember that a continuous time Markov chain for a discrete state space has to satisfy the probability that x of t is j given x of s is some i and further back history like x of sn is some i n down to x of s1 or s0, it doesn't matter, i0. We want that to be just um, we just need the first condition there, or the latest condition. And it has probably bothered some of you that I do not just keep the pattern going. And, you know, why am I not talking about the probability of x at time s n plus 1 being j, given x at time s n being i, and further back history? Like, why did I kind of change the notation up here. The reason I did that is because if it is a Markov process, then the full probability has to equal just the first conditional part. And with this notation, it appears that this is dependent on n, which is a non-homogeneous Markov chain. 
but we're talking about homogeneous Markov chains. We took a little break and talked about the non-homogeneous Poisson process, but for time homogeneous things, this probability should not depend on time. And it kind of looks like it does, but that's only because of the subscripts that you use to describe the points you're looking at. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the reason that I break from this pattern, S, S1 and I1, S2 and I2, Sn and In, and then I go to S and I and T and J, because I don't want it to look like it depends on N. This is just a function that does not depend on N, but I'm plugging in things that look like they depend on N. All right, so it's time to go back to basics and talk about transition probabilities. So you should always assume, unless we're talking specifically about that non-homogeneous Poisson process, that this is time homogeneous. So let me write my, let me get rid of those ends entirely. So I've got x of t is some j given x of n is some i, and this is for s less than t. And this is the part that remains after you've dropped the history. So you have a Markov process and you have all the history and you drop it and you just have this. So this depends on i and j and in general could depend on s and t. So not using that, I might call this p sub ij of s and t. But if it's time homogeneous, I don't need two time points to describe it. So now I'm going to say time homogeneous. This should only depend on one time point. And I'm going to rewrite this as the probability, just like we've been doing for the Poisson process. I'm going to fix where we are at time s, we're at i. And then look at where we are t units of time later. And if this is time homogeneous, it shouldn't matter where the s is. So this should depend only on t. And so we're going to use the notation. Like I might say, why is this equal to that? Because this is how I'm defining the right hand side t sub i j of t. And I'm sticking again with my um, conventions throughout where I use subscripts for discrete things, whether it's time or states, states, and I use like parentheses for continuous things, which is time in this case. So these are our, our transition probabilities. And we can organize them into a matrix, which is not actually going to be a useful thing. Into a transition matrix, the transition matrix we had before gives us one step transitions, but there is no concept of one step here. There's just a length of time. So I have to put, I mean, my matrix is going to depend. I'm going to use the same double P, but it's going to depend on time T. And this is just going to be the matrix that has the PIJ T as the IJ entry. And this is not very useful because you need a different matrix for every T. But what is actually happening is we're really um, in continuous time, we're gonna talk about infinitesimal transition probabilities, derivatives, um, which will be rates of transition. And we're gonna put those in a matrix and that's gonna be called a generator matrix and we won't get there today, but we're gonna really establish everything as before, our stationary equations, chapman colma goroff stuff in terms of a generator matrix, which is filled with rates of instantaneous rates of transitions of probabilities, which is not time dependent. Okay, so uh, I guess we can actually do chapman colma goroff this way though, and I think it will be useful. So the chapman colma goroff equation, we can state in a couple of ways. We're just gonna state it in one way. And it says the probability you go from i to j in s plus t units of time can be written as the sum over k as the probability you go from i to k in the first s units of time. And you go from k to j in the remaining t. And this is for any s and t greater than zero. I guess one of them could be equal to zero. And I actually said that wrong because I don't go from I to K in S units of time. 
um, the transition to K may have happened before time S, and then we stayed there and didn't transition again because it's continuous time. So really, this is the probability starting at state I that you are in state K at time S, but the transition doesn't happen at time S. It's just you've got transitions and you're looking at some time S, which may not be a transition time. Almost surely it is not. So we can prove this in exactly the same way that we did before. The probability you go from I to J in S plus T units of time is the probability that, um, so I can use an X something and an X S plus T. I'm just gonna use, since it's time homogeneous, X S plus T is J given X zero is I. Assumption is time homogeneous. And you remember what we did. We conditioned on where we were at that intermediate time step. So I'm going to sum over all possible states. I'm going to call, call them K. And I'm going to look at the probability that um, I am in state K at time, just to make this work right, at time S. <laughs> so this is oops, S plus T equals J. And I'm gonna go straight to the conditional stuff. When we first did this, I, I put that in there as an intersection so that you can get the probability above as a marginal. But then I moved it to the right. I'm gonna go directly there by conditioning on where we are at time S that we're in some state K and that is still conditional on where we started, which can be dropped by the Markov property times the probability that XS is in state K given x0 is i, and this goes by the Markov property. We only care about where we are at the last observed time point, and we are done because I have the sum over k of the probability I go from k to j in t units of time times the probability I go from i to k in s units of time. Is that what I wanted? Yeah, that's what I wanted. It's just written backwards. Really, nothing has changed. And because this equation starting from here and ending up here looks like matrix multiplication, it looks like the ij entry of the, the big P matrix at time s plus t, uh, we have just seen or shown that the overall transition matrix at time S plus T is equal to, so the way I have it written up here is it's equal to the matrix at time S times the matrix at time T. That's also what I have written here. I need to actually switch these, but we could have conditioned on where we were not at time S, but at time T. So this is commutative. We could, we could flip those around. S and T greater than zero, and maybe one of them or both of them could equal zero. Um, so S T greater than or equal to zero. Uh, T, the matrix of zero, is the, the transition probabilities in zero units of time. And in zero units of time, you can't go anywhere. So if you're at state one, you go to state one with probability one. If you're at state eight, you go to state eight with probability one. It's ones on the diagonal, and this is the identity matrix. So it does make sense to say the identity times the identity is the identity. We are gonna get to these rates and infinitesimal transition probabilities, but in my remaining two minutes, I want to almost define vocally, I won't have time to write this out, a birth process. This is gonna be the next stochastic process that we're gonna spend some time on. And so I'm just gonna have a lot of symbols here, but it's gonna be a stochastic process. And it's gonna be like a Poisson process where you think of the X of T as a total population size at time T. And then you think of arrivals as births into the population. And yes, we will eventually have a birth and death process so that it can go up and down, but this one can only go up. So it's just gonna be like a Poisson process, but remember, the, one of the conditions for our Poisson process looked like this. The probability that we increment by one 
given we're anywhere at time i. For the Poisson process, this was lambda h plus little o of h. And we didn't care about this because of the independent increments thing, right? When we didn't care about where we were because this is not telling us where we are at time xt plus h. It is the difference between xt plus h and xt. So we actually didn't care about, about the conditional part, but now we will because if there's more people in the population, maybe there's a higher birth rate. Maybe not. That seems kind of natural. So in the birth process that I'm going to define next time, we're going to leave this in and the lambda is going to depend on I, but otherwise look like a Poisson process. So that just keeps increasing. So can't have a stationary distribution, but then we'll talk about a birth and death process, which will go up and down and that has an equilibrium. So we're going to talk about stationary distributions for continuous time processes and find that and relate it to the so-called generator matrix that I have yet to define. Next time on Markov Processes.